Hello to our viewers here in Los Angeles and around the world. I'm Christy Brown Montesano, Chair of Music History at the Colburn School, and I'm here with Scott St. John, Colburn's Director of Chamber Music. As some of you may know, we postponed last week's lunchtime concert as the United States confronted an additional challenge, but sadly, one that was not new. The Colburn School has added its voice to those in Los Angeles and around the country who have spoken out against the injustice, brutality, and violence confronting the Black community. We know that this alone is not enough. In fact, the Colburn School is thinking deeply about how we, as performing artists and educators, can do our part to battle the abhorrent and enduring racism in our city, our country, and the world. We are listening, reflecting, and planning the actions we will take to build on the values we hold so dear, committing with new resolve to equity, inclusion, and diversity. Colburn knows our social media audience cares deeply about these issues, and we'll share more with you soon. We are aware of how powerful and healing music can be. And therefore, we are resuming our lunchtime concert series. So welcome to this fourth episode of A Serving of Beethoven, Lunchtime Concerts. And Scott and I are very happy to be joined today with two of our quartet artists, uh, cellist Clive Greensith and violinist Bree Fotheringham. Um, a Serving of Beethoven, which will be offered every Thursday at noon for the next several weeks, is one of many online performance offer offerings that the school is presenting to keep us Colburn connected with the performing arts. And of course, we're wanting to celebrate the big birthday this year of our pal Ludwig von Beethoven. The online platform for a serving of Beethoven lunchtime concerts offers our viewers and listeners the chance to engage with us directly by asking questions. We welcome queries about our guest artists, Beethoven, the featured quartet, or other relevant topics. Just post a question in the comment section of our live stream on the Colburn School Facebook page. So Scott, um, uh, would you formally introduce Clive and Bree and tell us about today's quartet? Of course. Uh, thank you, Christy. Uh, today we'll be hearing Beethoven's String Quartet, Opus 59, number one. Uh, this was originally performed back in October during our Beethoven 250 Festival. Colburn was immersed in Beethoven for a week that was built around the String Quartet cycle. We celebrated Beethoven's 250th birthday and also honored our longtime faculty legend, Arnold Steinhardt. For the two weeks preceding the festival, groups of mixed students and faculty prepared many of the quartets for performance. Clive Greensmith is the cellist and faculty member that played in today's Opus 59 number one. As a former member of the legendary Tokyo Quartet, Clive is certainly well acquainted with all of the Beethoven quartets. Uh, also joining us for today's chat is Bree Fotheringham, who played second violin in the group. And Bree is a violin student here at Colburn studying with Robert Lipson. Uh, I should actually be more precise, Bree just graduated from Colburn with her bachelor's degree a few days ago. So congratulations to Bree. Uh, thank you both for joining us on this live chat. And uh, let's, let's start with Clive. Um, Clive, can you share what, what makes this particular quartet appealing to you? Well, um, on a very personal level, um, this was the first Beethoven quartet that I really fell in love with. And I was about uh, 18. And in those days, we all listened to LPs. And in fact, a, it was a bit of an operation. You had to go to the school library, stand in line, ask the librarian to, to rummage around in uh, 10 different rooms, bring out the LP, and then I would go to my little listening station and get the score out and have a listen. So. It was actually the box set of the RCA, the first set of recordings that the Guarneri Quartet made uh, of these works of the 59s and also of 74 and 95. So I, I had this in my ear and I was uh, 
I quickly fell in love with this particular piece, and that's why I wanted to to play it when you asked us, Scott, which uh, faculty members, which pieces we would like to to work on with our students. So, um, of course, it starts uh, two movements, three movements out of four start with a cello solo, which, <laughs> of course, yeah. for purely stylistic vanity reasons, was appealing. But um, what happened for me in the early days with this piece was that I, the piece spoke to me, and um, I later fell in love with the late quartets and the, and, and the Opus 18s, but I love the middle period Beethoven, as we call it. I love the breadth of the music. I love the idea that he'll take a scherzo movement and you'll have 10 minutes <laughs> rather than, you know, it's, it's a short sort of uh, affair. Um, the the um, highly ambitious nature of this music with its incredible dissonances and the uh, egalitarian idea of, 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 of the different voices having such a wealth of, of spread responsibilities is, is what's attractive. Um, and there is a kind of a, a wonderful, well, I mean, you can't argue with how profoundly moving the slow movement is and then the, 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 the joy that one gets with that, that special kind of intense uh, feeling happy to be alive with, with Beethoven and uh, the finale is always, uh, 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 it's, it's difficult, but it's, uh, it's one of the most uplifting feelings to get to the end of that, of the end of the finale. Um, I remember as a student having um, a rather interesting experience with the piece because I'd, I'd fallen in love with the work and I wanted to do it. And we had a Beethoven Prize uh, at the Royal Northern College of Music where I was a student. I was in my second year, I think, so I was about 18. And I put a group together myself and I decided that we were going to learn it. And, uh, and I, I still have the, uh, the report that came from the jury and it said, <laughs> these four players drastically underestimated the challenges of this enormous canvas <laughs> and basically panned, they panned the performance. And I thought it went rather well <laughs> in my naive sort of teenage uh, state. Um, but the piece kept cropping up. I remember I had to sub for the cellist of the Gabrielli Quartet, which is a, a major English uh, string quartet. And uh, Keith Harvey, uh, was unwell, so I, I sat in for him, did the tour of Spain, and I, I, the piece kept, it, it, I kept uh, uh, performing the piece with different groups, but it wasn't until I joined the, uh, the, the, the Tokyo Quartet that I really got to study it and tour with it and then record it, and then I really felt like I, I, I knew it uh, better. And so what was lovely about this was that I was then able to bring all of those experiences to my three younger colleagues, and I, and I also remembered that initial experience when when we were so badly panned by by our rather uncharitable teachers. Uh, <laughs> I was determined that I would give them a good experience and that uh, we would make it. Uh, we wouldn't underestimate the the enormous challenges of the vast canvas, and that we would rehearse properly, but that we would more than just the rehearsal and putting it together. We would uh, get as much. Um, uh, depth and, and, and sort of uh, get inside the music as much as we possibly could. And I'm happy to say that, uh, well, we'll see how it sounds on second hearing, but it certainly felt like we, uh, we um, dug deep and, uh, and found a lot more in the piece than, than a, a cursory glance or, or just a summer festival reading would have given us. That's great, thank you, Clive. Um, well, just uh, while we're speaking about the, the, the great challenges of, of this quartet, uh, I wonder, Brie, if you might uh, give us an impression of what it was like to work on this piece or what it was like to prepare this quartet. Yeah, of course. Well, thanks for having me. I had an, an incredible time working on this piece. It's funny, um, similar to how Mr. Greensmith first approach this piece. I This is the first Beethoven quartet I ever fell in love with. I remember listening it to the first time and I just absolutely loved it. You know, the cello solo at the beginning, um, every movement is just kind of gorgeous. And so I remember when Beethoven, the we the people started talking about having a Beethoven week, I uh, really wanted to play this 59-1. And I remember seeing that it was gonna be uh, scheduled and that uh, Mr. Greensmith was playing the cello part. And I, it's really funny because that first recording that I came across was actually the Tokyo Quartet. 
mm-hmm. with Clive playing. So it was, um, I was like, oh, I really hope I'm in that group. And it turned out that I was put in that group. So I was really excited to be part of it. And yeah, like uh, Mr. Greensmith was saying, it was a really, um, it was a kind of intense first uh, look at the piece. I'd never played it before, but I feel like we really got a lot out of it in a short amount of time. And of course, you know, being able to ask Mr. Greensmith questions about all of the different, you know, intricacies was really, really helpful. And it was a really great experience. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. Um, do you guys want to mention, because uh, we, we haven't yet talked about who else was actually playing in the group. Um, I don't know, Bree, do you want to sort of uh, introduce your, your colleagues? Yeah, of course. Um, on First Myelin was Hao Zhao, who um, is a good friend of mine and just really did an incredible job. And also Cassie Drake, who's, yeah, she's in the same class as me. And she, yeah, she was on Viola. Oh, that's great. Um, and I know, uh, Clive, you, you gave a little uh, sense of some of the things that, uh, that, that you appreciate about this quartet. Um, and maybe this question could go either to anyone here, to Clive or Christy um, or Brie. Um, but, you know, how does this quartet kind of fit in the historical um, sense of Beethoven's quartets? And why is this one um, so revered, do you think? Christy, would you like to start ball rolling no. on that one? Sure, I'll start the ball rolling. I mean, we've talked, um, when we did, when we listened to Opus 59, number two, just a couple of weeks ago, um, we talked about the fact that there had been a significant number of years that had passed between Opus 18 and the Opus 59 quartets. And as Clive, as you said, he's now, he's, he's written the Eroica. And so this heroic middle period is really happening in earnest. And this was an incredible year that he wrote, in which he wrote the quartets, 1806. He had finished Leonora and um, Fidelio, as it would be called. Um, and then I was looking at the list. In order, basically, he completed the fourth piano concerto, the fourth symphony, the violin concerto, and Coriolanus in that order. And then he gets to uh, Opus 59, which he writes between like July and November. So. This is an intense time after struggling with the genre of opera. He comes back um, to so many of what we might think of as public genres. So he's coming back to symphony, um, concert, overture, and concerto. And there's a lot that people have talked about as if these are very public works in, in a sense for the quartet, which had long been a more intimate salon, private uh, connoisseur genre. Um, I found it interesting also that before writing these quartets, I was looking at what he had been studying. One com- commentator said he went back to a lot of North German uh, counterpoint and, and studied, you know, in fact, we get a fugue in the first movement. Um, and also Haydn Opus 20, which surprised me. So he actually went back and looked at some of his uh, mentors' works. Um, and I think you see this, uh, kind of public, but also what we might think of as uh, connoisseur-like uh, artistry of being able to show, I know how to control these deep, I know how to entertain you, but I'm going to make this complex and interesting and challenging and kind of wow, um, including the length. So a lot of people talk about the first movement, about uh, number one being a lot like Eroica, that it has this enormous length. Uh, and I was surprised to find, because I know you've talked about like the scherzo so being being so big. Apparently, he thought about adding repeats to both the first movement for the for the development and recap, um, and also another repeat in the scherzo. So they would have been even longer. But by the time he got to publishing on the final version, he he ditched that idea. So he had big ideas. Those are the things I was kind of uh, coming across in my readings and studying. Oh, that's great. Um, it's interesting. I, the, oh, go ahead, Clive. Yeah. Uh, Christy, it's an interesting point because there's the Beethoven Opus 18, number five. That's he, he was looking at one of the, the Mozart A major quartet, and there's an identical variation movement. And I was interested to hear your comment about Haydn from the Opus, Opus 20s because the, um, the counterpoint, there's so much variety. He goes through so many different keys. With that scherzo movement, 
when we were preparing it, Brie, I remember we were all marveling at how you'd think it would be over and that it comes back in another key and then there's all this sleight of hand uh, and there's a lot of humor in the in the music too, which is yeah. which is one of the fingerprints. And um, in fact, the whole ending of the sketch though is is one big joke. And I, I was determined that we would bring out the the lightness as well as uh, the, the the other the undertones of tragedy and of uh, 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 poignancy. Um, Sorry, Scott. You no, know, I was I was just going to say. So, we, should we briefly um, just mention the, the the Russian connection, or and you know maybe I don't know, Clive, if you want to. I, I see a cello there, but I don't know if you if you might want to sing the like the opening of the of the theme of the last movement, which has the. Uh, Oh, he's gonna go get the cello. Very yay, good. Yay, yay. <laughs> yes, this is an, of course another one of the Razumovsky quartets uh, for this chamber music loving uh, Russian ambassador to Vienna, who is the dedicatee who commissioned the works. So he included some Russian themes, and Clive's gonna show us. <laughs> Great, thank you. This Always is, nice to have live musical demonstration. Exactly, it's lovely. I did want to say there was one thing I came across when you talked about Clive. The there, of course, is gravitas and seriousness in this, and of course, he loves to bring that um, pathos or seriousness and even mourning into his slow movements, depending yes. you know, different different variety of of emotion. In this one, it, it came out that. Um, he had, uh, on May 25th, interesting date in these times, his brother, Casper Carl, died. Um, and he began writing the next day, the Opus 39, number one, and had some sketches for the slow movement. And what I was looking at in that, um, I wanted to find the quote. So keys meant something to the composers of this time. Um, we, of course, know that Christian Schubart wrote about aesthetic tonality, like how tonality gave a, 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 an emotion, an aesthetic. And for the key of F minor, he writes, deep depression, funereal lament, groans of misery and longing for the grave. So that uh, he usually does a lot more variety with his tonality, but here we go a straight F major and we're going to move from B flat kind of to, and then F minor. So it's an interesting choice for him. And given the real life loss for him, I do think there's probably something to that choice of yes. key and the tone of the slow movement, which is the third movement that people can be listening for. Since it's a rather large work, I wonder if we should uh, move yeah. towards that section of the program. I'm, I get a, just, we had one, um, question which how popular were, quartet, were his quartets in his day even though there was bad reception at the beginning somebody actually called it like crazy music and it was like within a year um people were already starting to get it and praise it for its kind of complexity and and depth so there was a pretty big turnaround but initially didn't romberg there's the whole story that he stomped on the paper because it of the cello part so, you know, we have these kind of initial reactions, but uh, they got it pretty quickly. Yeah, we're at 1220, so I think we can uh, move on. Thank you again to those who posted questions um, and comments. As usual, we will continue to engage with your comments and questions during the performance, so please post away. Clive, Bree, Scott, and I will all be watching. Uh, we'll add some comments throughout the performance, um, giving you some interesting signposts about the music you are hearing. So thanks so much to our special guests uh, joining us today. Thanks to Bree Fotheringham and Clive Greensmith, uh, two of the people who will be playing um, in our restream very shortly. We encourage you to join us again next Thursday at noon for another lunchtime serving of Beethoven. Next week will be the iconic Opus 131 Quartet, one of the very famous, yes, uh, uh, an amazing piece. And the Kalidor Quartet will be playing that. So let's, uh, let's go now uh, to hear Beethoven's Opus 59, number one quartet with Clive Greensmith on cello and joined by 
three fabulous Colburn students, Hao Zhou, Bree Fotheringham, and Cassie Drake. And this is from Zipper Hall at the Colburn School in downtown Los Angeles.
That <laughs> was fantastic. Amazing. Right. Oh, such a pleasure to see our students and Kai working together there. We really hope that you've um, enjoyed this riveting performance by our wonderful cello faculty, Clive Greensmith, along with Colburn students. And we hope that this, this performance has also brought some positive energy to your day. So please join us next week, Thursday at noon, for another live chat and a performance of Beethoven's Opus 131 with the Calidor Quartet. From all of us at the Colburn School, be well. Goodbye.